Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy. You know, to recharge. Hey folks, good morning and happy Mother's Day to you. Um, from a outside perspective, motherhood is a hard job. I've had the privilege of watching my wife uh, become a mother, deliver our daughter, raise her, and go through childhood, teenage years, into young adulthood, and my daughter to be a woman of faith uh, as an adult now. And I can tell you that there are wonderful experiences that I watched along the way and challenging experiences I watched along the way. Yeah, many a woman might come into motherhood thinking that she's going to have it all under control, that she's got it figured out. She knows exactly how it's going to, how the show is going to run and she's going to run the show. Then she has kids and learns, oh, she doesn't know everything she thought she could or thought she would. Children are going to take them through those valleys and those gut wrenching turns when all the mother can do is hold on for dear life. Kids have a way of blowing up a mother's pride. And frankly, the woman is a better individual because of it. In life, there are ups and downs. There are times when we like to say we've got it all under control, but then life hits curves and all sorts of dark tunnels. And while we're driving through it, trying to maintain a level of confidence and strategy and stressing, life goes off course at times. 
when our life car crashes, we realize, like moms do, that we didn't have the control that we thought we did. And uh, all of a sudden, we're welcome to Humbleville, the place in life that perfectly positioned you to live better. We're at session four, and it's going to be principle number three in this challenge of one life to live. Now, it sounds kind of morbid. We're not talking about just having 30 days. I pray that's not the case. I pray that everyone listening has a long life. The idea is that if over a 30-day period, you live like it's the last of your life, that you're really going to learn in those 30 days how to live better and better. And we've talked about living passionately and loving completely. And we're coming today to the third principle. And all these principles are drawn from the life of Jesus. You know, Jesus knew he was on the way to the cross. And if we look at his life, we're going to see principles for how you live if you're living in your last days, if you will. And today is going to be another one of those principles. And this principle is learn humbly. Principle number three is learn humbly. And we're going to look at Philippians 2, beginning at verse 8. So turn with me, if you would, to Philippians 2, verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. There God also, therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to share your word this morning. And Lord God, as I said at my dining room table, I pray that uh, I have that reminder that you're here. That I'm indwelt by your Holy Spirit and that it's you, Lord, that will well up this message if I'll just simply get out of the way. So, Lord, I have and I am surrendering myself to you. But Father, because of my limitations, withhold anything that I might try and say of my own, that I might try and push through. And you just take over control. Father, for all those listening, for all those that are isolated in their homes, for all those that are stressed about the conditions we're in right now and wondering when we'll regather, Lord, I pray that you prepare them for this moment, just to have ears to hear and a mind to perceive and a heart to open up to the truths that you put in us as we, as we learn about this life that Christ lived and that we're to live as we follow Christ. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have those verses in front of you, I'm going to ask you to underline a portion of it. If you're writing your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to underline humbled himself. Let me say that again. I'm going to ask you to underline humbled himself. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit gave the word to man to write it down. So the Holy Spirit gave Paul these words to write in Philippians. Uh, and we're being told that Jesus, the creator of all, if you read the beginning of John, by whom all things were created, and if you read Colossians, who sustains all things, Jesus humbled himself to come to earth as a man. Now, I have talked to people from other faith beliefs, and they just cannot accept the fact that God would put himself in skin. But that's exactly what our Savior did. He put himself in skin, and he came to earth. Now, he could have come as an immortal king. He could have come, you know, not dealing with stumped toes and not dealing with thirst and not dealing with tiredness, any of those things. He could have come not as a poor individual, but as the ruler of all. I mean, he had that position. He could have done that. But again, he humbled himself to be born as an infant, dependent on mankind, to put himself in the hands of man, to have to be taught, to learn all of those things, to grow up, to well, we don't read it in the scriptures, but living the human condition to experience stump toes, uh, those type of, uh, of events of life. Uh, we do read of him being hungry. We do read of him being tired uh, and uh, thirsty. We read of these type of things in the scriptures. So he put on humanity, 
But even more so, the, this forever God came to mankind as a man, experienced all the human condition, humbled himself to those things. Why? To die. Scripture says, humbled himself to the point of death. The cross. And we have to ask ourselves a question, why? Why would Jesus do that? Why would he come out of forever where we want to be, by the way? We want to get to heaven where there is no sorrow, no pain, no crying. We want to get there, but Jesus came from there to come to earth to be here to be like us. We don't really want to be like us. We want to be free of the stress and striving and rejection and all of these things. But he came into this, and, and the hint is the text that says became obedient. You see, it was God's will, God the Father's will, that God the Son would come to earth. And it said, familiar scripture, for God so loved the world, not the way of the world, but the creation, the people of the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, we can skim over that gave, and we just think handed over, but remember, he was handed over to be brutalized, to be rejected, to be spit upon, to be nailed to a cross, to be killed. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's, that's why Jesus humbled himself. Because that's what God the Father wanted. Why? Because the sinner's curse is death. And I read a quote from a, a past saint this morning that said, Jesus became what we are that we can become what he is. Jesus became what we are. He took on the curse. He went to the cross. He died in our place that we can be free and have liberty, that we can be restored to a relationship with God, our creator, that we can become what he is. And if we keep reading Philippians 2, 8, 9, and 10, we're going to get to that point where it says, therefore, and that's a wonderful therefore, because Jesus humbled himself under all mankind to be the servant of all mankind, all sinners. God highly exalted him. But Jesus didn't raise himself up. Jesus lowered himself. Notice the direction of his life. Jesus lowered himself. And God raised him up to such a height. That scripture says every knee should bow and every tongue confess. That's everybody. Those in heaven, the angelic, the raised, the saved, those on earth, those that are still living, kings and paupers, everybody in between, and those under the earth. You could read that as the dead, the demonic, are going to bow, should bow. God raised him to that level. What happened in Jesus's life is exactly what Jesus said before he went to the cross. He, he spoke this scripture. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, what is humbleness? We tend to go through life thinking humbleness is, oh, I'm just so bad. I'm I'm. I'm broken. I'm wicked. Uh, there's nothing good in me. Oh, woe is me. Uh, I'm despicable. I'm a doormat. I'm useless. That's what we think of as humbleness. But when we look at Jesus's life, we find that that's not the humbleness that he exemplified. He didn't go around saying those kind of things. What Jesus did was put himself under the authority that God the Father put over him. And Jesus put himself under the authority of God the Father and obeyed him. That's humbleness. And that's exactly the course of his life. That's exactly the place that Jesus took. But see, we, we tend not to live that kind of way. I can remember in 1998, I was promoted to a position that I had sought after my whole career. And right away, right as I was given that position, I was called on to attend a company conference in San Antonio and a trade show. So I'm wearing my suit and tie, walking by the Riverwalk through San Antonio downtown. If you've ever been there, you're familiar with it. 
pretty high minded. I had arrived. But apparently there was a pigeon that didn't get the memo because he pooped on my soup shoulder. True to the scriptures. Raise yourself up and you can bet God's true to his word. There's going to be a humbling that's going to come. And, and all of a sudden you're going to get a pigeon training. But if you want to follow the life of Jesus, and I pray that you do, if you want to avoid pigeon training, then I'm going to encourage you to listen to three principles to live with a lisp, an LSP. And we're going to unpack these now. Number one. Learn from your losses. Learn from your losses. And we're going to look to the life of Peter. We looked at him a few weeks ago. Everybody's path loses. There are losses that happen along the way. All of us end up in the forest of difficulty or frustrations. You know, the wheels come off the wagon at times. And, and Peter's no no exception to that. Peter gets this high call in his life. He's told by Jesus that he's going to be the rock. He's going to be the foundation stone upon which Christ is going to build his church. And Peter takes that information and he does what most of us would do. He, he, he puffed out his proverbial chest and got a case of the big head. And so later on, when Jesus is meeting with the disciples in the upper room and he tells them in that meal, that all of them are going to run, all of them are going to fall, all of them are going to betray him. Jesus does something that's just, uh, Peter does something that's just hard to believe. He disagrees with Jesus. He says, Jesus, in so many words, if all these other people leave you, if all these other guys run away, I won't run away. I'll stick with you. Look, coach, put me in. I'm not going anywhere. You can count on me. I am not going to fail you. That's the rock talking, right? I mean, that's what Jesus called him, the rock. But pretty soon, Peter, instead of a rock, was going to be a wreck. Because when the pressure came up and difficulty was being thrown around and Jesus was being tried, Peter three times, not just once, not just twice, three times denied even knowing Jesus. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Everybody loses in life. All of us experience some kind of difficulty, some kind of setback. But here's the catch. Everybody loses in life, but only some people learn from it and live better. Everybody loses, but only some people learn from it and live better. Peter's going to be one of those individuals. A little further down the road, the ladies are coming to the tomb. And when they get to the tomb, there's an angel there. The angel says he's not here. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. That's what the angel said. And Peter. See, Peter's behavior had excluded himself. But what we find in the scriptures is the Lord wasn't done with Peter. Peter might have thought he was done because in his confidence, he, he said, I had eroded. I had ruined. I had denied. I'm no longer useful. I failed. And the failure had led him to weeping and despair. But that and Peter reveals to us that the Lord is the Lord of second, third, fourth, umpteen chances. And you know the ladies go and they tell the disciples and Peter comes running to the tomb. And Peter is going to surrender to the Lord by the Sea of Galilee. And he's going to go on to preach the first sermon under the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And 3,000 souls are going to join the church. At the beginning of the book of Acts, Peter is going to be used powerfully. And he will go on to continue to be used powerfully. He lives as the rock the Lord called him. But it wasn't because of his confidence. It was because Peter learned from his losses. And if we're going to find that better life, we're going to need to learn to do the same. 
And there's a few principles that we want to share with you in, as part of this one life to live challenge on learning from your losses. Number one, take responsibility for failure. I, I'm going to tell you something that you already know. We live in a no fault society. We live in a society that everybody wants to find somebody else to blame. They want to blame their spouse for a bad marriage. They want to blame their kids for bad behavior. They want to blame their company for the fact that they're not working hard. They want to find someone. They want to blame their upbringing. They want to blame their community. They want to blame their society. They want to blame somebody because if I can find somebody else to blame, if I can put the fault on somebody else, I can maintain my confidence and my pride. You see, if I can take it and hang it on you, if I did that wrong because of you, if I haven't performed well because of you, then it's not my problem. And I can stay puffed up. I can stay rock solid, right? If you had been, I could have been. But because we exalt ourselves with blame, we set ourselves up to be humbled by God. And because we exalt ourselves with blame, we prevent ourselves from being raised up by God. If we really want to get back to living a better life, then we need to take responsibility for our part of the failure. It may not all belong to us. Some of those things may be true. But we need to take responsibility for our part. We need to admit our fault. Listen to the scripture. Proverbs 28, 13. This is God's word, not my word. He who covers his sins. What? God's word says will not prosper. How do we cover our sins? Blame. Not taking responsibility. Not me, somebody else. Look at the second part. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. We need to admit our fault as a first step. We need to take responsibility for what we've done. But then there's a second part to learning from our losses. We need to let go of guilt. As an individual that's been called by God to counsel people, I have run into many that really don't have a problem uh, and with the wonderful news that God has forgiven them in Jesus. They can accept the fact that he is a loving, merciful God that can take what they've done wrong and put it on Christ. I have found the greater problem for many individuals is forgiving themselves. And many avoid taking responsibility because they don't have the ability to let the guilt go and be done with it. But what many don't realize is that's a pride problem as well. Because what they're saying is they know more than God. God has seen fit to forgive them. But they're harboring guilt against them and have counseled many that at what point did you become more holy than God? That you have a higher standard than he did. That you demand more than he demands. Romans 8, 1 reads this way. There is therefore now no condemnation. And if you write in your Bibles, don't write on the screen. No condemnation. Therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. It's not what my body's done. It's what the Lord's done. It's not my failures. It's the Holy Spirit's presence. You might need to remember those words. Because you might wallow in guilt and stay there. Peter dealt with these things. Peter learned from his losses he took responsibility for the denial. And he, when he met with Jesus and Jesus said, do you love me? Three times, Peter responded, I love you. He let go of the guilt so he could go forward because we have to go forward in life. Prideful Peter was not useful material for the Lord. Let me say that again. Prideful Peter was not useful material for the Lord. Failing Peter, broken Peter, mournful, sorrowful Peter was putty in the hands of God. It was like Jesus was dealing with him 
God was dealing with Peter and saying, Peter, you know, I'm willing to run your life for you. I'm willing to work through you. I'm willing to do some amazing things with you. And I'm going to. But you got to give over the wheel to me. Look, you've got me sitting over here in the drive in the passenger seat and you're holding on and, and you're saying we're going to steer and we're going to do this. And, and th he said, just get out of the driver's seat, get in the back seat and give me the wheel and watch what happens. And Peter couldn't do it until Peter crashed. Maybe you're at the crash. Maybe that's what he's saying to you right now. Maybe you haven't crashed yet, but you're headed for a crash. Because you're running your life on your own and you're, you're doing it, maybe not brashly, but you're doing it in these subtle ways of not taking blame and not letting go of the guilt. And those are still aspects of pride, still aspects of raising yourself up that are gonna lead you to a humbling. That's the L, that's the L in Lisp. But the next comes an S and I know I didn't spell it right, Lisp. The next is surrender to God's strength. Let go, uh, learn from your losses, surrender to God's strength. When we have losses in life, what tends to happen is that we decide we're gonna play it safe. We, we don't wanna risk. We don't want to go back out there into life. We're gun shy. So we wanna play it safe. We wanna do risk avoidance, even maybe risk aversion. It, it, we just don't want our insecurities to show up. We don't want our failures to be manifest. We don't want our fumbles to happen again. None of those things. So we just kind of, bow out of life and we put ourselves on the sidelines and we exist. I've shared with the church numerous times that I was on the football team for one year, but I really didn't want to play football. I just wanted to ride the activity bus with the girl I was dating, the one I'm married and I'm still married to, by the way. So the coach would say, I want you to go out there and kill him. All I wanted to do was get to the activity bus. I didn't want to kill anybody. And sometimes we ride the sidelines and we bow out because of failures in our life. At this point, remember Paul. Paul prayed three times. <laughs> there's, there's something about that three. You know, Peter denied three times. Jesus said, do you love me three times? Paul prayed three times for the Lord to remove his thorn in the, in the flesh. There's all kinds of conversation about what that was. We don't know. And frankly, I'm glad we don't know, because then we can plug in our own issue and say, Paul had a problem with Doritos. You all know that's my issue. You know, it's just, you know, he prayed, Lord, take away my hunger for Doritos. And the Lord wouldn't do it and prayed again and wouldn't and prayed again and wouldn't. I want you to understand God doesn't always take away what we ask him to take away. God does not always take away what you ask him to take away. And maybe the reason he hasn't taken some things away from you is like Paul, that is the very thorn that is going to require you to depend on God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he, God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. What God supplies is enough. This is what the Lord is saying to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. For and, and, and go right after the comma. For my strength, God's strength, is made what? Perfect in weakness. Oh, but that's so counter to the way we want life to work, isn't it? You see, we want God's strength to be added on top of our confidence. Mm -hmm. We want God's strength to be added on top of our successes. We want God's strength to be added on top of our maintenance of pride. But that's not what was learned by Paul. This isn't the way it works. 
like Paul, we ask God, take away the weakness, take away the weakness so, so that we can stand in front of people and we can speak boldly and eloquently and, and we won't fail and they won't see our weaknesses and they won't see our knees knocking, or our face turn red. They won't hear us missing a note when we read or they won't see a stumble in ministry. We, we want to hide those things. We want to shy away from people knowing them. But it's those very insecurities, it's those very failures that we try to bury and that we try to blame on others that perfect the strength of God in our lives. Think about the people God called Moses to be the spokesman for him to Pharaoh. And Moses stuttered. You had Amos, who was called to be a prophet, and he said, I'm just a piercer of sycamore figs. You had Mary, who was called to be the mother of the Messiah. And she was a simple, poor girl. You had Peter called to be a fisher of men, and he was an untrained and uneducated fisherman. Weakness was the place to perfect the strength of God. We need to get a grip on something here. God's intent is not to make us self-confident. Let me say this again because I don't I want you to be set up for the next part. God's intent is not to make you self-confident. God's intent is to make you confident in him. And if he took away all the weaknesses, and if he took away all the failings, and if he took away all the frailty, are we really going to be more confident in him? The history through the Bible is individuals uh, who had things going well in their life were not trusting in God. They were confident in their possessions, in their things. At one point, the Lord refers to them as fat cows of Bashan. That thorn in the flesh that you're praying for the Lord to remove may be the very thing he knows he's leaving there so that you'll be strong in him. And and the better approach, the Paul approach, if you will, the better approach is to say, is just to admit, just to admit to the Lord something like this. I can't handle it. Lord, I can't take any more. But Lord, I can, I can, I can do all things through you. See, what what is that statement doing? That statement is saying, I don't have the ability. I'm admitting it. But I'm not telling you to take away the call. I can't take any more pressure. But you can take it all. It's just saying, let your power go through me. That's the S in living with a lisp. So learn from your losses. Surrender to God's strength. And the P, pursue God's path. Years ago, when I worked with youth at my home church, one of the favorite things the youth loved to do is a lock-in. It'd be an all-night event. And that was a time in my life where I could stay up now and then that long. And of that lock-in event, the favorite thing they wanted to do was play hide-and-seek in the church. Turn off all the lights in the church, three-story church, three different areas of the church. Uh, They wanted to be in the dark, and they wanted to play hide-and-seek. And even though we knew every aspect of that church like the back of our hands, you still had to move slow and be careful going through the church because you just couldn't see. There was one moment where my nephew decided he was going to take off running. And he ran head first into a cinder block wall. Had a big knot on his head. I think that's why he's messed up the way he is today, quite frankly. Hope he's listening. Ah. You just can't move that fast in life when you can't see clearly. And now think about how we go through life. We're sitting here today and we only know this moment. We have no clue what the rest of this day is going to entail. You might have a plan, but you don't know that that's what's going to happen. So you're going to move with some 
trepidation through the rest of this day. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You might have a plan, but you don't even know what it's going to be like. We as leadership of the church are making some plans for when we can regather. We know the governor is supposed to be sharing uh, something, you know, this this coming Friday, but we don't know what he's going to say. You know, we know what phase one looks like and we're reacting to some of those things. But he might say, no, I don't think you should meet until next year. He might say you can meet next Sunday. We don't really know what he's going to say. More importantly, we don't really know what God's going to say to us. That's the bigger thing. We don't know when God is going to say, okay, enough's enough. Regather. My point is we're going through life and we're going really into the dark. We see our past fairly clearly. We see our present pretty clearly, but we can't see the future at all. So we move carefully, cautiously, slowly. But listen to what the scriptures say. Psalm 119, 32, I will what? Walk, totter, no, run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. I will run the course of your commandments. What we read in the scriptures is those individuals who are on God's path can go at breakneck speed because they're on God's path. God is their vanguard. He's ahead of them. And God is their rear guard. He's handling the obstacles ahead. He's handling the obstacles behind. Why? Because it's his path. It's not my path. It's his way, not my way. And since I'm surrendered to him and you're surrendered to him and Jesus is surrendered to him and Peter surrenders to him and Paul surrenders to him, God is the way maker for them. Raising them up. And they can run. There isn't the need to throttle back your life. You can go full throttle. There isn't the need to be passionless. You can be passionate. There isn't the need to guard love. You can love completely. We don't need to stumble and bumble over our faults. Why? We're pursuing God's plan. We're not being held back by those things. We don't need to fear and fret over enemies because God knows where they are. and He will deal with them. They're not in the dark to him. There's no need to say, I can't. You can boldly admit, I am weak. I have failed. I have sinned. I have messed up. But my God is strong. And I'm focused on him. I'm running to God with all that I've got and doing all that he has commanded me to do as he works through me. I'm stepping in and into his greatness. So let me slow down for a moment. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel restless? We talk about learning humbly. Do you feel like you're fighting to get through life? Do you feel like you're you're going through quicksand? And for all the energy you're putting out, you're really not getting anywhere. And life keeps overwhelming you more and more and more. Are you just tired of trying to carry it all on your own? Are you being Mr. or Mrs. Atlas trying to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders and you're just about done with it? Listen to the words of Jesus. Come to me. That begins with a, that's a humble approach, right? Come to me starts with an admission that you need him. Confidence begins to go out the window. Who's to come to him? All you who labor and are heavy laden. It doesn't talk about color. It doesn't talk about nationality. It doesn't talk about age. It doesn't say perfect people. It doesn't say the most decadent individuals. It doesn't say kings and paupers. It says all. All you who are overwhelmed by life. And what's the promise? 
and I will give you rest. It's not you're going to rest yourself. It is a promise from the Lord that he will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We began this by imitating Jesus, didn't we? By looking at how he humbled himself. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Those, that's the promise of Jesus. Jesus who died for your sins. Jesus who was buried in a tomb. Jesus who was raised by God. And ascended bodily to the right hand of God the Father. He says you'll find rest for your souls if you come to him. So are you anxious? Are you tired of trying to make yourself holy? Are you try, tired of trying to get over your addiction? Your dysfunction? Are you try, tired of trying to fix your family yourself? Are you tired, moms, of trying to correct your kids yourself? Are you tired of trying to make your way through this world? Are you tired of trying to make yourself worthy of God? Are you tired of religion? The answer is simple and likely the hardest thing that you will ever do. Come to Jesus. Learn humbly. I'm going to give you an illustration. If you can, grab a piece of paper, a little scrap, doesn't matter, a little scrap and a pencil or a pen. And I'm going to ask you to do something. It's not, you're not going to show it to me. You're not going to send it to me. You're not going to type in anything to me. On that little piece of paper, I just want you to write your greatest worry right now. Your particular, this is between you and God, your particular greatest worry, greatest struggle, the greatest burden, if you will. The thing that you're fretting and fighting or failing at. All right, having done that, right over top of it, over that same thing you wrote, I just want you to write one word, wheel. W-H-E-E-L. You see, that issue exists. Somebody's got to lead through it. Now, once you've done that, once you've written your greatest burden, greatest struggle, greatest failure, whatever. And once you've written wheel over top of it. If you're willing, this is only if you're willing, this isn't an exercise for me. This is between you and God. If you're willing, I want you to take it and slide that paper away from you as if you're sliding it to God. And maybe for some of you, it's your sins. Maybe the greatest burden you have is that you know you're separated from God because of your sins. You've rebelled against him. You haven't given honor to him. You haven't followed after Jesus in your life. And you know that if you had passed away right this moment, that you aren't going to be in a heavenly place. And maybe what you wrote is sins and you've written wheel over it because you've been trying to get out of it and trying to do better, but it hasn't been working. And you, you're sliding your life over to Jesus. I pray that you're doing that. I pray that you've done that. And you're saying, Jesus, here's my sins. I believe you died for them on the cross. I want you to be my savior and raise me to a new life. I need it. I can't do it on my own. I need it. I want it. I'm desperate for it. Others of you might be sliding addictions over. Things that you've wrestled with for years of all different sorts. And you've been trying to steer through it. But this moment, this moment, you're willing to get in the back seat and say, God, I can't. You can. I give. I'm putting the weight of the world on your shoulders where it belongs. Maybe some of you, it's your marriages. Others of you, it's your physical health. 
It might be work-related issues. It might be concerns about a nation. It might be finances. It might be your kids. But instead of trying to become confident and strong in ourselves, how about today? You learn the way to be exalted is by learning humbly. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you didn't make the course to you a mountain that people needed to be able to climb because that would have excluded a lot of individuals. We can't reach perfection of our own and not everyone has the stamina to climb the mountaintop to be great performers or great orators or great singers or great theologians or great humanitarians. Not everybody can reach that level of greatness in their own, but you didn't do that. You didn't establish that as the base. What you said is humble yourself. And everyone can do that. Everyone can surrender to the low spot. And what do we find at the low spot? We find Jesus already there. We find Jesus having humbled himself to the point of death, even the cross. You see, we don't come to Jesus by climbing higher. We come to Jesus by surrender and admission of fault and desperate of need. And Lord, this is why when I read the scriptures, I find that it was the tax collectors and fishermen and harlots that found Jesus because they came to the low spots in life. While the religious individuals and the rich individuals just couldn't humble themselves to find him at the low spots of life. And Lord, I pray my thanks for those individuals that are hearing this and will hear this and recognize that they need to surrender to their sin condition and admit it to you. And as they push it to you saying, Lord, save me, I'm grateful for salvation that will take place over those that hear this. And Father, I pray that they will just reach out to someone who can then help them in discipleship and in growth in you. They'll find a church home to gather with. Father, I'm grateful for the addictions that are being surrendered to you and the marriages and the health and all those other things that, Father, we just, we're not equipped to fight them. We're not qualified to fight them. We're not strong enough to fight them. But we can learn humbly. And Father, as I close this time of sharing, thank you for being a God of many chances. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Goodbye all.